Well, welcome back to another episode of Naturally Healing Autism. I am Karen Thomas, your host, and uh, we're really, really happy to have you here. This uh, show is for parents of children with children on the autism spectrum. And of course, anybody, uh, especially children with special needs, but I like to give a lot of valuable resources and I often interview experts on various types of of uh, specialties that can be helpful for your children for getting them better on their road to recovery healthier happier kids and that's what we're about everything on this show is also natural resources uh, and anything that we talk about I will link to at the page where this podcast will be released at not naturally healing autism.com so you don't have to worry about scrambling for a pen and paper and writing everything down I will give the links that we uh, any links that we talk about I will give on that page so afterwards you, you'll be able to find them there and today we have a special guest with us um, again this is uh, today we have dr. Christopher Shade and I'm going to give you a brief bio on him so you get a little bit of his background to understand um, what kind of he specializes in he is the CEO uh, the CEO of Quicksilver Scientific his vast depth and breadth of knowledge passion for healing and intuitive understanding of chemistry and biology are reflected in Quicksilver Scientific's well-designed detoxification protocol unique supplement delivery systems and patented mercury specimen test Dr. Shade is in high demand as a lecturer. It is because Dr. Shade has many innovations at Quick Quicksilver Scientific that are recognized globally. Dr. Shade is a recognized expert on mercury and liposomal delivery systems, and we're gonna get into that. He has lectured and trained doctors in the US and internationally on the subject of mercury, heavy metals, and the human detoxification system. Dr. Shade developed the patented liquid chromatographic mercury speciation technology used at Quicksilver Scientific while conducting his PhD dissertation work with advisor Robert Hudson at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. This technology was used to create the mercury tri-test. Dr. Shade's current focus is on the development of cutting-edge lipid-based delivery systems for nutraceuticals, and such such as liposomes and micro emulsion systems and don't worry we're going to explain that <laughs> to address the growing need of high quality affordable detoxification systems so without further ado welcome dr shade and thank you so much for being with us here today thank you i'm always happy to come in and talk to uh, autism parents and uh, really i'll talk to anyone who will listen yeah, there's a, there are a lot of needs out there, and um, I know that you have a lot of really, really great uh, things that you have developed, and, and uh, I, I actually have a program for parents of children on the autism spectrum, and I have included your pro products in that, some of them, because of a couple things. Um, I'd like you to really explain the, uh, the high absorption ability of the, um, the emulsions and, the, um, and your technology, the liposomal, yeah. no. because parents have a really hard time giving children with autism or special needs products of any type, right? They can't take pills, so you have to have it, it can't have a lot of taste, there's all these issues around it. And these liquid forms that we can just squirt in their mouth and let it absorb into their, um, their, into their system without having to go through the gut, because the gut is usually not working well, um, that is so helpful. And there are a lot of very various different things that, uh, that you have your products that can help different needs of children with autism. So can you start with maybe explaining a little bit of the, the liposomal forms and, and how they're so beneficial? Yeah, so like you said, we're, we're trying to get past hitches in the system. We're trying to get past limitations on absorption. And we started doing that when we were working with molecules that don't get absorbed like glutathione. So glutathione is crucial to detoxification, immune poise, and aging gracefully. And uh, in a capsule, it just gets broken apart and not brought in. And that's one example, but even uh, vitamins and herbs that you have some degree of absorption for, if your GI tract is a mess, sometimes you won't absorb them anyways. And it could be the 
amount to absorb leads you to needing to take grams and grams of it. And uh, with an autism child, you can't give them 10 capsules, so you got to put it in water, and then it tastes bad. So how can we cheat the system a little bit and get passive diffusion across all the mucous membranes? That's what we're going for here. And so we use these lipid-based technologies. So lipids are oils or fats, and the particular focus that we have is using phospholipids. Phospholipids are the half fatty, half water soluble uh, components that make up your cell membranes. So if you think of a cell, they come together in two layers called the lipid bilayer, and they have their fatty tails pointing towards each other, and then the head would be water soluble. So you can get phospholipids, very high quality ones, isolated from seed oils, from sunflower seed or soybean seed, and, and they're coming as part of the oil pressing process. And they come out of the oil pressing as lecithin. And then we use companies that, that then purify phosphatidylcholine in particular from the lecithin. So some of the lesser structures of so the lecithins, proteins and, and waxy parts and cholesterol, those are all left behind and you're left with this pure phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine itself is a tremendous dietary supplement. It feeds the liver in its processes of detoxification. It builds membranes in the liver and all through the body. It builds membranes in the brain. It gives it gives uh, a substrate for acetylcholine in the brain. So we start with this very good compound phosphatidylcholine. And when we put it into water, it naturally forms these spheres. And if we have something dissolved in the water, like uh, vitamin B12 or glutathione or vitamin C, it forms spheres around those. And then we can take those spheres and through physical shear, we can break them down into smaller and smaller spheres until they're so small that they passively absorb across the mucous membranes. Mm -hmm. And in the oral cavity, there's, you know, if you bite yourself and you bleed, you're brushing your teeth and you bleed, the capillaries are very close to the surface there. And these little spheres can penetrate between the cells in your oral cavity and get into the capillaries and into blood very quickly. And then what you swallow is doing the same thing all the way down, penetrating, finding capillaries, getting into solution. And this gives us a high efficiency of absorption where we don't have to rely on normal mechanisms. Some mechanisms are transporters, and the transporters can be broken. Some mechanisms for absorption of, say, fat-soluble substances are for bile to form similar spheres with the fat-soluble compounds, making these uh, chylomicrons and different emulsion-like uh, spheres in the GI tract that then passively absorb. But what if you don't have good bile flow? Uh, and so these are all things that can work against you. So we it's kind of like pre-digesting it, but it's taking it into transport spheres right off the bat. And so one thing it does for you is high total absorption. And the other thing it does for you is immediacy. The amount that gets absorbed intraorally and in the upper GI is in your blood. We've tested it in as little as two minutes after taking it. Boom, it's already in there. And then there's a steady rise up to about 30 minutes, linear rise. And then from 30 to 50, 60, it's sort of uh, peaking over and then settling and then starting to come down. So that immediacy benefits you. Like say you're giving something that settles down at an anxious child, something like uh, CBD from hemp or GABA. You're going to get that immediate reaction. Say you're trying to do a protocol, like we use this in our liver detox protocols, where we take all the liver su uh, supplements at once. It stimulates the liver to dump bile and toxins out of the liver. And then 30 minutes later, we put it in a binder, like charcoal, clay, uh, chlorella, those kind of things that are known for toxin binders, and they can pick up that whole mess. So in a short window of time, we can have a discrete operation on the body. Dump, catch. And uh, so there's a lot of different things that, a lot of different problems that are solved by this. Uh, and the flavoring tends to be a little bit better. And uh, so that's why we do these particles. And then there's a couple different kinds of particles. So one is what are they? Well, they're spheres made out of oils. They go in really quick. But then we make a couple different kinds of spheres. And this is, some people get tripped up a little bit. Well, is it liposome or liposome? Is it an emulsion? Is it a nano emulsion? Uh, 
If I make the sphere out of phospholipids and it has the lipid bilayer enclosing a watery core with a water soluble in it, like vitamin C, glutathione, B vitamins, that's a liposome or liposome is really more technically correct, but we've got into saying liposome. So that's a liposome that's got water in the middle. A nano emulsion would have oil in the middle. So uh, our DIM product has an oily core of MCT with the DIM uh, dissolved in that with a monolayer of phosphatidylcholine and another surfactant and a, a couple of uh, essential oils. And I know and, to interrupt yeah. really quickly, um, can you tell our listeners what DIM is? Because a lot of people don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. DIM is great. <laughs> what is DIM? Diindolyl methane. It is extracted from crucifers. It's known as being a part of broccoli and, and cauliflower and cabbage that was known for handling estrogen metabolism. So it was taken for a lot of women who were worried about breast cancer and uterine cancer. And that was really where it made its name. But I found a much broader use for it because it's really good at unblocking a blocked liver. So what would be blocking the liver? Specifically, it seems to work very well in the case of mold toxins, where molds are shutting off the normal detoxification mechanisms in the liver. So a lot of really stuck livers do really well with that. It's also really good at hitting a gene trigger called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, meaning it turns up processing of uh, hydrocarbons that have these aryl groups, uh, that would be plasticizers, solvents like uh, benzene, zoluene, uh, xylene, toluene, uh, numerous other volatile uh, organic co compounds, sort of gasoline-like compounds. Those are straight chain, but it'll work on those too. So it's working on a lot of these uh, xenobiotics uh, that are estrogens, like xenoestrogens. Mm. And so it not only handles your body's metabolism of estrogens, but it helps you break down uh, xenoestrogens. Xenoestrogens are estrogen-like compounds coming from outside that are hitting estrogen receptors and behaving like estrogen, even though they're not estrogen. So uh, it's really good at handling a lot of these compounds. Our liver detoxification protocols all include them in there. And something that nobody was picking up on until I started bringing it into the literature. And I only looked it up and found it because it was working on so many people to lower food allergies. It was the first thing that we noticed is people's food allergies were going down. And then we found all this as, uh, effect of DIM on the immune system. So in the immune system, you have this yin-yang thing called Th1 and Th2. Th1, you want activity from because it kills invaders. It'll kill the viruses, bacteria, fungus that are coming in. It's your mercenaries. Uh, and you're born with that. And then Th2 is the acquired immune system. And that's antibody reactions. But allergy happens in Th2. And what happens in most of the cases that we're looking in at with autism, with chronic disease, is you get an elevation of Th2 and a decay in Th1. So they have chronic infections in your immune system, like, yeah, whatever. And then on the food side, it's like, no, we can't eat that. We can't eat that. Oh, no, heaven forbid you'd give us broccoli. And you're like, God, I can't eat anything, and I'm filled with infections. And so what you need there is some immune narrowing down what you eat, but the food intolerance is creating constant inflammatory reactions and inflammatory states block detoxification. So inflammation holds the toxins in. And if you're constantly responding to the food while you're trying to detox, you can't detox. And then you start being hypersensitive to the detox supplements. So DIM squashes that, that brings that reactivity bar down so you can hop over there with some supplements and some food and start getting some work done. Right. So DIM is, DIM is just a, it's a, you know, one of the workhorses for us. 
So it would be something that you would see in the earlier portion of the protocol for somebody, like beginning with DIM. So yeah, that, starting to open up, you know, creating tolerance, mm -hmm. creating, opening up the liver. It's, it, yeah, we always use it in there. And we've started mixing it. We have some new formulas coming out with Quercetin uh, and luteolin in it, which are mast cell stabilizers. Mm -hmm. So they're handling it at both ends. One, lowering the immune uh, early reactivity that's sending out the signal, and on the other side, stabilizing the mast cells, which are what makes histamines. Right. So, you know, holding down the histamines and, and stopping the immune system from ever propagating the reaction. Yeah, I personally had a lot of good good success with uh, with using um, uh, quercetin in the past uh, for like yeah. reactions as a natural. It it works so well. I yeah, guess. And, yeah, and now putting it in the nanopod because when you're using quercetin for immune reactions, you're using grams of it. We're using like twenty milligrams, and it's like whoosh, just stops it dead. So that brings me to the sensitivity of a child with autism, uh, like glutathione, dim, things like that. So if you're starting this detox reaction, this dump, you got to start really slowly. And even then, you know, I, I teach muscle testing in my program, and I noticed that you have some things yep. on your website yep. as well around that, um, to teach parents how to know what dosage is to start out with, because we can't just follow a recommended dosage on any bottle because it's way too much for a child with autism. So it might be a drop a day or a drop every couple of days versus, so how do you, um, you know, what are your thoughts on how the, the this, especially like a, the liver dumping of toxins and yeah. things like that on this sensitive system? So can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? All right. There's a whole bunch of things that could, we could do the whole interview all around just this question. I know, there's so much. <laughs> Everything that we've been doing is feeding into this problem. Uh, for 10 years, I've been working on how to minimize the reactivity and maximize the effect and get the right doses. So the problem was always, oh my God, they react to everything. So I got to give them this much. And how long is it going to take to detox them when I give them this much? It could take that long. You know, so it's like a 20 year detox protocol. So how can we get deeper into this? And so we started by trying to minimize reactivity of the body and we're doing it neurologically with GABA and CBD and immunologically with DIM and Crested. But we found that a lot of reactivity is because of a poor liver directionality. Liver directionality means that you're going to work on toxins, conjugating toxins. You know, there's these phases of detox. You have a toxin, you have to make it sort of reactive for a second so you can link something like glutathione onto it, and then you got to transport it. Well, the transport out is coincident with the transport of bile. In fact, if we imagine a membrane here, here's the hepatocyte, here's the bile tree, there, there's transporters that go through that, and the bile transporters... Uh, well, what they used to think was the only bile transporter was the BCEP, bile solid export pump. But the MRP2, that was thought to just do toxins. But it turns out it does toxins and bile salts. And they go up and down together. And things like endotoxemia, endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide that you're getting from the leaky gut, pull those transporters out of the membrane there. And they put them in a little liposome inside your cell to protect them. So you stop when you have strong inflammatory reactions, you even stop moving that. So you have to use supplements that keep that flow going and protect keeping the transporters in that membrane and keeping the flow going from hepatocyte into bile. Because what happens when they pull out and you can't go into bile? There's a transporter over here that goes back into the blood. It's called MRP3. And that's there because when the toxins build up, uh, especially bile salts are actually they dissolve the, uh, the liver cell. And so if they build up, you have all these mechanisms to throw them back into the blood so you don't dissolve the cell. And so when you get blocked in that liver directionality or blocked in the flow to the bile, you go back to the blood. So if you give something that winds up detox, like uh, like pollic acid, you start winding these reactions up and it goes bang, bang, shoots back into the blood. So where does it go then? It comes out through the skin for People with leaky gut, leaky blood brain barriers, boom, it goes to the brain and you've got neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation picks up. Or it's starting to go to the kidneys, one of the things it's doing. So you start getting lower back pain and stress in the lower back. 
And these are what we refer to as detox reactions, Herxheimer reactions. Oh, I feel worse detoxing. And a lot of that is not getting right directionality. But right directionality is two parts. So getting across here into the bile. All right, say we do that. Boom. All right, we're in the bile. Where are we going from there? We're going down the bile tree, through the gallbladder, and we got to get through there and into the GI tract. And then wherever we got to go, we got to no, we got to go another 20, 30 feet out to the toilet. And there's all kinds of opportunity for the toxins to come back in. Mm -hmm. So we have to support the movement to the bile, to the GI tract, and binding it up so it doesn't come back in. That's all key to not having the reactivity. All right. So that's one part of it is don't wind up detox and throw it all over your body. Get it out. Right. That was reactivity. The next part, capsules and things that you have to take a lot of to absorb a little bit need to go down through the GI tract. And a lot of the initial immune sensing around things is in the GI tract. So dendritic cells are part of what are called antigen presenting cells that need to read things and say, I like that or I don't like that. They're already a little wound up. And then you got to jump three grams of something into the gut and just to get, you know, a couple milligrams in. And so you have a high concentration of things. And so you get reactivity building from the GI cap tract. And that really happens when you got capsules where everything's concentrated and won't part when it, when it cracks open. So you got that. So now we're using smaller amounts so we, and we're getting it systemic. So we're minimizing reactivity there too. Now we get to the questions about dosing. Hopefully I'm not covering too much in one, but now dosing. That's important. How do we get to dosing? Find the right dosing. So everything is about titrating up. You're starting low. Yeah. You're entraining the body into this program of starting to release everything and you're working your way up. And it's important to recognize something about things that promote detox. They are in themselves minor toxins, but they're toxins without great side effects. And the mechanisms of detoxification they bring up are responding to their presence and saying, oh, let's clean up a little bit. Because things like arsenic are actually detoxification promoters, but they've got some pretty bad side effects. And so lipoic acid is actually not an antioxidant in your cell, but turns to a free radical and turns up detoxification. So we need to proceed slowly and then train the system in doing this at the same time, move away the, uh, inflammation and get the, bottom ready for, the body ready for this. But then where do we start on this? So if we can muscle test and we muscle test well, and a muscle testing is a two part interaction. It's the tester and the patient coming together and uh, it's sort of an externalization of intuition. You know, and you can say, you know, our light fields, you know, there's all that great, uh, you know, high in physics work out of Europe by Fritz Albert Pock and people like that, demonstrating that you actually emit photons and that there's a communication between organisms through their photon fields. And, and ideally in this uh, relationship of muscle testing, you know, there's this cueing into each other of what the organism can handle as it sort of in its light field feels the supplement and it feels back to you and whoever's doing the testing. And if you're nice and clean, you're gonna get a sort of, you know, harmonization of the light field that says, okay, this is good, we can do this or not. Uh, so, so that's my view on how muscle testing works. And as long as the old noggin's not thinking too much about what it wants to see, and, and, it's, and it's open to feeling that, it's really good at narrowing the field of possibilities and getting to something good. Uh, you know, and it's best in the context of knowing, having an intellectual knowledge of where you should be going and what you should be doing, and then using it to focus down on, 
well, I got three different NRF2 upregulators. Which one's going to harmonize with this guy more? Uh, or I've got three different possible doses. Where should we start? And you remember in this titration chain, which is you're starting low and you're working up high, you're always going to have an ideal place to come in to get the most done with the least react. Activity, and you're trying to estimate that point. If you don't want to do that, start low and keep adding it up until you see reaction. If you're getting too much reaction, pull back. If you're getting nothing, keep going up until you see something. And you know, seeing a little bit is okay. It means that you're starting to work the levers. And the more coherent your detoxification protocol is, the less likely you are to have problems. And then when we get into uh, when you are having problems and you're starting to have reactions, uh, some people you know, like to pull away with everything. Yeah. And it's best to know what's provoking movement of toxins and like out of the tissues, because think of it as a microcosm, macrocosm. There's movement from the tissues out into the blood. And while you're circulating in the blood, that's when you're in the most potential danger. And then there's filtration of the circulating toxins from liver, kidney, GI to get out. So there's provoking and filtering. And when you provoke out and the blood levels are getting higher uh, and then you're getting symptomatic, you want to stop provoking, but you want to turn up filtration because you want to get those levels down. So you want to support the down and out. So things like uh, what supports, if we go back to the liver membrane, PC and bitter compounds, support the movement through the membrane. It's important to remember the PC part. PC and bitters support the movement through the membrane. Binders help stop recirculation and they stop the primary uptake of endotoxin from the GI tract. So when you're symptomatic going in with binders and the best endotoxin binder is charcoal, we use a blend of charcoal, clay, kytosan, and our metal binder, IMD, with a whole bunch of acacia gum. That one's very well tolerated and gets everything. Uh, so more binders is usually indicated and more bioflow, bitters, and anything that supports kidney when they're symptomatic. But stop things that support uh, the movement out of the cells. So that'd be anything that upregulates phases. I'd lower glutathione. I'd lower Certainly, like polic acid is a strong provoker. Uh, polyphenols are provokers. DIM is a provoker. That one I hold back on, whereas bitters, PC, and binders go up when we're symptomatic. I will also, for our listeners, I have a muscle testing video um, that I will I'll link to um, that you could you could understand a little bit more of how to use muscle testing. It's sort of a, a layman's way of just teaching muscle testing. So I'll link to that at the, at the bottom of this video at naturalhealingautism.com on this page on the podcast. And, and it, takes, it takes weeks to really get in the groove of it. Right, just, just practice with your spouse, you your friend. Yeah, you just freaking get yeah. good. <laughs> just start and, and especially, you know, if you're, you know, if you're linking up with your child, you know, you already have that sense so well. And you're just externalizing it and you're putting, you know, a more finite answer on it. Uh, and it's really just getting your muscles. I do a lot of this with two fingers. It took mm-hmm. weeks to get those at the right. So they're, they're matched to each other, you know, and doing this, it takes weeks to really get that vibe for that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, so uh, that way parents can know too, you know, you, you do, especially with things like glutathione, you might see an increase in stimming or an increase in behaviors. Like they're getting yeah. more, you think that's when parents tend to pull back. Like you said, they're just kind of like, oh, this is, this is scaring me. So this can't yeah. be good. You got to get some trust. The muscle testing will help you. Yeah. Uh, and it's always, you know, I, I say push until you get a little symptomatic and then have some faith and keep moving because that's going to, that first hump is going to go down and you're going to come out into the valley, but you won't, don't want to make it too bad. And they've certainly had experiences where it got, you know, out of hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the more we align all these doors, the milder that hump is going to be and the greater the benefit after the hump. Right. And can you talk a little bit about B12? Because methyl, of course, methyl B12 is very important. And you have a, a, a nice uh, liquid liposomal form. Uh, right. But some kids still have 
problems with methylation, which I think we should address. Methylating and getting right. People aren't on. familiar with that, so B12 can cause worse reactions. So, backing off or moving to a hydroxy B12, or if you can you kind yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. You'd actually want to switch over. We we'll get a hydroxy in our line. Mm, um, we okay. Haven't done it yet, but you if it's too much, you want to switch over. Or yeah. you know, in the in our B complex we that's pretty well balanced i mean you have to be a severe hypermethylator to hypermethylate on that okay and you have to be a severe undermethylator to have a problem with that because uh the folate source we have this folinic which is one step from folate and so it's way better than folic acid but it doesn't over methylate and then it's balanced with a decent niacin dose and then it's got the the methyl b12 and uh, a little bit of TMG, but that one's got a broader range of tolerance, like uh, MTHFR 677 types. You know, if, if they're double mutant, I'll have them do that and throw a little bit of methylfolate on there. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're over methylated, I'll have them take a little extra niacin to balance it. Uh, but that's more forgiving. Uh, just the straight B12, you know, that's methyl B12 and it gets in fast. And if they're over methylating from it, Ain't nothing you can do there but switch away from another one. Whereas that's in the B complex, but is balanced more with other stuff. And another product I've had good success with of yours is um, I definitely want to get into cannabis real quick in a minute here, but um, yeah. uh, mitochondrial issues. Um, yeah. the, the one is uh, it's called the one is the name of the product. The one, you know. If you're only going to support, if you're only going to take one supplement, what would it be? <laughs> for the mitochondria. Is that how you came up with that name? That's where it came from. It's the one that <laughs> because Neo, Neo supplement. <laughs> Things like um, you know sluggish behavior, fatigue, um, even constipation. The the muscles in the bowel don't have enough energy because uh, the body isn't making it properly, and uh, and that's um, something that happens with mitochondrial issues. So we need to support it with things that help give the body energy. One of those, you, you mentioned uh, the, a, a B supplement as well, but, um, but CoQ10. And so you yeah. blended, the one has a few yeah. different ingredients, doesn't it? It has CoQ10, and everybody knows that. And then it's got... PQQ and resveratrol. PQQ is sort of everything CoQ10 and resveratrol ever wanted to be. Uh, <laughs> because it makes more mitochondria per cell and makes them more efficient. So it's the super mitochondrial upregulator, but it's also a really strong stimulant for BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which stimulates new neuron growth and is neuroprotective. So it has a huge neurological side, the PQQ. Uh, then resveratrol. Resveratrol is known for supporting very efficient metabolism paths in mitochondria. And some of the paths of PQQ overlap with the resveratrol and some are unique. So you're hitting all of these metabolic pathways to, to make strong mitochondrial pathways. And then you're putting in CoQ10 to be used as a substrate for, reserve, for mitochondria to turn over energy. And there's some tocotrienol in there which is also supporting mitochondrial and a light NRF2 upregulator. And then that's in a base of PC and adaptogenic herbs. And the adaptogenic herbs are supporting uh, right cortisol levels, uh, right adrenal and endocrine balance and endocrine response. Uh, and so it's hitting uh, neurological, mitochondrial, uh, and and endocrine pathways all all at the same time. In yeah. fact, there was uh, one of the first cases that we did just with two supplements, uh, the hemp hemp CBD and the one was uh, we took this kid like five years in one year. It was like crying every every couple of days. You get the new update. Oh, now he rode his bike, and now he did that, and now he did that. It was it was really amazing what could get done by building and calming and that's you know when we get into cannabis it's calming the fire in the brain and until you calm the fire you can't rebuild right but GABA and because of course if the gut is not working properly the GABA system largely comes from the gut GABA's job for, for the listeners is to calm the nerves down so yeah. if the gut's not working properly one of the many things that can happen is that if GABA can't uh, work properly 
the brain can't get enough uh, of its calming, the calming receptors. And so and that, and that locks you into right. sympathetic overdrive. And then you can't detox, you can't rebuild, you can't repair. It's only till you flip over into parasympathetic that rest, rebuild, repair come in. Otherwise, when GABA's, when GABA's irritated and you're toxic, you're fight or flight. You're just locked in. Right. And the body can't function because it, it's, it's in this survival mode or yes. it can't detox. So yeah, it's a, it's great too, to take gob at night and help sleep, things like yeah. that as well. But as you're rebuilding the gut and, and helping it to heal, it's a, That's really a great crutch anxiety. Exactly. And then CBD, uh, you have a, your Colorado hemp oil product is a, is also very calming, good for anxiety, correct? Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. And that's a better, so GABA and CBD are, are both, they have a lot of overlap and then they have some differences. So for blocking neuroinflammation, nothing is more effective than hemp derived CBD because neuroinflammation is an interplay between the activated glia, which is part of the immune system. It's supposed to behave differently in the brain than it does in the periphery, but uh, under neuroinflammatory cir uh, circumstances, there's a, uh, a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and certain things get into the brain and they activate the immune system in the brain and it starts creating inflammatory states. And so it secretes pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then hit the neurons and activate the neurons at the glutamate receptors. And then the neurons secrete other things that reactivate the microglia. And so they're fighting back and forth. It's like a political war. It's your know, right wing, left wing. They just won't shut up ever. And it's like, <laughs> so you need to stop that, right? And CBD stops it at the glial side. It stops them, you know, hurling political insults. Uh, it stops that secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. On the neuron side, it stabilizes the glutamate receptors. So it's shutting them up on both sides. While it's an NRF2 upregulated, meaning it upregulates glutathione genes, and it blocks pro-inflammatory genes. So it's doing all this at the same time. And then you've got uh, uh, cannabinoid receptors in the brain, and it works uh, on the CB2 receptors. It helps activate them by turning up your own endocannabinoids, anandamide and to arachidonoglycerol, which are also having uh, inflammatory mediation they're cr controlling inflammation and cbd it's i mean it's so important because all right it's working on a neurotransmitter level by balancing gaba and glutamate all right so that's its neuroprotection it's working on an immune level because when you activate cb2 you have inflammatory control you you have proper inflammatory response and it's working on your hormone system. In fact, the largest amount of CB2 receptors in the body are on the uterus. It is really an, a hormone balancer as well as a neurotransmitter balancer and a immune balancer. So it's neuro, endo, immune, poise. That's why uh, you know, hemp oils are just so, they work on so many things. People say, oh my God, it saved me from this. It saved me from that. It saved me from that. It sounds panacea because when you get neuroendoimmune balanced, a lot of stuff just falls away on its own. Right. And then, so, so I actually had this happen with my own son. Um, he had been um, going through recovery and doing pretty well at one point. This is many years ago now, but then he reached puberty. And I have a lot of parents in my program where it's like kind of everything's yep. kind of going okay. We're making progress and bam, oh. puberty hits. <laughs> and those, those hormones come in and the brain just goes crazy. So the CB2, too, the CBD your, your oh, would be a really yes. good product at puberty. It yes. Help bring those all together. And then with the one that adaptogen blend is a hormone modulator too. Oh, yeah. And so uh, some of the moms have been using it on the boys when they go through puberty. The adaptogen blend, a different adaptogens, adaptogens are bringing to the center. And puberty is doing anything but bringing to the center. It's going that way, it's going that way, it's going that way. It's going and so both the hemp and the adaptogen blend are bringing to the center. 
Does the Colorado hemp oil have the adaptogens in it, or it's something? No, no. the one does, and Nanomo Nanomojo is just the adaptogen. And uh, what's it and called? Nano what? Nanomojo. Nanomojo. We have two adaptogen blends. We have that, and then we have Thrivogen that's more about women uh, balancing women's hormones. But you're you're mostly working on the male side with autism. So the Nanomojo is just the adaptogens. And then the one has about 20% 20, 20 of it is Nanomojo adaptogens. And the rest are all these other, uh, you know, the peak, uh, the rest of it is mitochondrial uh, modulators and, and metabolism modulators. Got it. Okay. So you have some of that in the one, but if you need more, you just go to the Nanomojo. But I didn't finish saying GABA versus CBD. So CBD is, I really want to get across that it's balancing the whole system. It's probably the more important long-term one. But GABA is a very good crutch when you need GABA up. So GABA glutamate balance with CBD, you're more, you're reining in glutamate from getting out of the hand and getting on top of GABA. Mm -hmm. But GABA comes in and it's very immediate and gives you that extra gob you need to you know right away to calm the system down and so sometimes you need to pepper in the gaba and it's better for sleep than cbd is cbd may get you back into sleep state but it just doesn't put you over the edge gaba is better for that mm -hmm. so have them both and you know sometimes it's, you know there's a good uh, aspect for muscle testing when using the one of those uh, I usually have them both around, and CBD is the more long-term, and then GABA is when I need a little extra crutch. For which one is better for you at that moment? Because it, we also change, even daily. Our systems yeah. have different needs. We have eaten something or had an environmental toxin or we've had more stress or our body is yeah. just naturally going through some type of a, a chemical shift, and so it's good to be able to learn uh, muscle testing. Yeah. And I will and, put that video. Some people, there's people who have uh, allergies to hemp uh, wow. you know, and okay. tend to be a little older. People have bad experiences with marijuana or you know, we're trying an edible and got too much of it or maybe we're co-poisoned if you're older and you're smoking that stuff in the 70s and 80s that was laced with paraquat. Different things trigger these. So more people have reactivities uh, to the hemp than to the GABA. And there's also orange oil in there. Some people have reactivities to that. GABA, there's less, uh, ability, less likelihood to be reactive to it. But the one reminder with GABA, uh, I remember one mom had this, you know, I was uh, with her at somebody's house and her, you know, very anxious autistic kid came over and I said, and he was like freaking out because he had a bad experience with the dog there before. And I'm like, here, give him eight pumps of this. And he just went, Zoom. and he said, okay, mom, I'm going to go play with that kid I've never met out back. And he went outside, smelled the flowers on the way out back. Mom's crying. And, <laughs> and it was just like a oh, 180 degree, you know. So what does she do, of course, being an autism mom? Starts giving him that dose three times a day. You know, first two days are great until his body learned to turn gob into glutamate. Uh, and you have enzymes to shift back and forth. So if you overdo it, your body's, you know, its natural mechanism was to shift everything to, to glutamate. And CBD is better at shifting that poise. And if you try to do that with GABA, your body will work around and start turning it into glutamate. So if you're having paradoxical reactions with GABA, that's because you're turning it into glutamate. And the more you lean on that, the more likely they are to do it. So feather it over the top, you know, as just a, uh, an extra little an extra little mood shifter. Right. Yeah. And it's important uh, that people that that was a really really good point. Um, you know, people think, oh, this is working great. I'll just keep giving them more. That's again where muscle testing comes in <laughs> and yeah. balancing things out and not, you know, yeah. slow and steady is much better than than fast and too much because yeah. we, you know, especially these kids are so sensitive. And glutamate is is a, is an excitotoxin for those of you yeah. who are listening and don't know that, um, such as monosodium glutamate MSG in foods. Of course, you want to make sure you're avoiding them always, but they're very neurotoxic, which means they're very toxic to the brain and they can cause overexcited 
suicide ability and can actually cause the uh, the neurons in the brain to excite themselves so much that they die. They, they oh, yeah. excite themselves to death. So that is a really mechanism of neuron death is glutamate excitotoxicity. And remember, you're making this. So the hyper ones have too much glutamate. They're making too much glutamate. And uh, in, our, in our own cells, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, evolution of glutamate toxicity is first it makes you anxious and then you start getting brain fog because mm -hmm. the anxiousness is creating or the overreactivity of the glutamate receptor is starting to make free radicals and then you're getting foggy and then the free radicals can burn up to the point that they kill the, the nerve cell right yeah yeah important for parents to know that but with no glutamate what do you have <laughs> no glutamate no attention glutamate is attention glutamate is is memory memory unfortunately is based around fear because it's survival these are millions of year old mechanisms it was much more important to remember what's going to kill you and then get anxious about it they weren't worried about neuroinflammation at the time. They were worried about survival. And so that side of the brain is, is what glutamate's doing. And when it's doing it properly, you're, you're diligent and vigilant when you need to be. And then you chill out when you need, when you need that. And That's when it gets out of hand, you have to control. control. And so when you're in that, the glutamate dominance, you also move all of your energy to survival. And you don't do rest repair, rest, digest, repair, regenerate. That's all when you're GABA dominant and relaxed. So there's this whole mind element of bringing things down. That's when you make a uh, headway in detoxification. Mm -hmm. And um, while we're on detoxification, I have a couple other things I wanted to ask you about, but the detoxification, you've got a, um, a, a, a mercury test i'm wondering about it does it all heavy metals or is it just mercury and and what's the method is it urine or is it um saliva we've got we've got uh two different ways that we go at metals uh the mercury testing is very very unique we do blood hair and urine and that's it's called the mercury tri test because there's three different things that we measure there and uh, we are the only lab clinically using uh, a science called speciation, where you're separating different forms of mercury. There's a different form of mercury in fish than there is in your dental fillings. And they move in your body differently, they leave your body differently, they go in and out of the brain differently. And so it's important to measure them separately. And when you do that, you measure them in the blood and separate them in the blood. Blood is a very good measure then of what your body burden uh, of these toxins are, of this of, of mercury forms are. And then hair and urine are representing detoxification roots. So inorganic mercury in your blood goes through your urine. We can compare the blood inorganic mercury to urinary and see how way how well that pathway is working. So it's a map of not just burden, but functionality of your detox pathways so if mercury is something uh that you do need a little bit of current exposure to get a good map here uh if you think that you know uh, you got seven shots uh six years ago and that twisted you down the path of neuroinflammation and autism spectrum and uh you want to know about that mercury there and you've never fed him any fish since then he's never had any dental amalgams you're not going to get a real picture there you're never going to actually have a good picture of uh of what's in the brain uh unless it's from a fish-based source uh, so if there hasn't been any recent exposure for the last couple of years, it's going to be hard to get a map there. On the other side, we do a whole metals blood test looking at nutrient and toxic metals. So in nutrients, you're looking at zinc, uh, copper, and you can look at those absolute levels of what the ratios are. You're looking at selenium, molybdenum. These are cofactors for detoxification, calcium and magnesium. Uh, those are all important nutrients. And they can also be toxins if you're out of balance or you have one way too high, like copper especially. And then you have toxic metals, arsenic, uh, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, lead uh, are your main toxics there. So that's a good map of all the metals in the body, and that will always be a useful map to you.
So, so it those, will measure the lead and the cadmium and uh, and the aluminum as well as the mercury, this test that you have. Yes, actually we don't have aluminum on there right now. Aluminum okay. is a tricky one to do with that assay. Uh, people are looking at aluminum a couple of different ways. Whole, whole blood aluminum is usually pretty good for that. Okay. And then you mentioned minerals, which is a good um, segue into uh, the um, the molecular hydrogen and the quinton minerals, because yeah. I know children with autism are always mineral deficient, and that's why I always warn them: you don't, you know, we want to use natural methods of heavy metal detoxification because the pharmaceutical ones will not only allow reabsorption of the toxins as they're trying to be excreted, but they also pull out all of the good minerals along with everything else that you're trying to get rid of. And, and we just don't want to deplete our kids any further. So we want to add them back in. So I, I know that the, the quinton minerals and then the molecular hydrogen would be something that um, could be helpful. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's cover hydrogen first, just because uh, it goes more with our discussions around detoxification uh, and free radical control. And there's my dog getting into the video there. <laughs> uh, uh, hydrogen gas, so you get hydrogen gas uh, dissolved uh, in water, is a great way to get this compound hydrogen that's acting as many things in the body and they're only really getting a handle on what it does are all the different things that it does so it was first uh, thought of as an antioxidant because it does react with uh with hydroxyl radical the strongest radical that you can get but it's not much of an antioxidant on other radicals what it is is another thing that brings us to the middle if you're too uh, you can have too much antioxidant activity. You need a balance between prooxidant and antioxidant activity. And hydrogen brings us to a balance there. You need uh, a balance, uh, like we said in the brain, between GABA and glutamate. You need a balance in the hormone system. Uh, you need adequate levels of cortisol, not too much, not too little. Everything hydrogen does tends to be a focus towards homeostasis towards the middle ground. I see it used in weight loss protocols. It's used in, in detoxification protocols. It's used in neurorebalancing protocols. And it is a true supplement. You're supposed to make it in the GI tract and it diffuses throughout the body and it acts as a signaling molecule. But some people don't have the bacteria that make it. And so it ensures that you get adequate amounts of this. And so there is almost no going wrong with hydrogen ever. And it's another thing where we need the middle ground. Autism needs nothing more than the middle ground. So we talk about CBD bringing you to the middle ground, hydrogen bringing you to the middle ground. And then we're gonna talk about minerals. So with uh, Canton, if you're French, like my wife used to say Canton. If you're from somewhere else in Europe, you call it Quinton. And if uh, you're sort of a Midwesterner, you call it Quentin. And I want the Quentin minerals. <laughs> and so no matter how you call it, they're all the same thing. And they're minerals that are from the sea. And then, again, nothing brings us to the center like the sea. This is where we evolved from. And these are minerals derived from off the coast of France uh, that come from a natural upwelling of minerals in an area. And there's an area, the, the, there's what's called the global conveyor belt, which, and this is a uh, million year long uh, 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 tidal patterns of the ocean where they'll go all the way down to the southern hemisphere, go down and then call all the way north and come up. And these ones that are coming up are bringing minerals that they gathered from the ocean floor, really hard to find minerals. And they're really clean at that point. They don't have, you know, cause this is really old water and it comes up off the coast of France and it comes up in this vortical pattern. And because it's got all those nutrients, the phytoplankton grow there. And uh, so there's an area where there's this uh, vortex that you can see from space of phytoplankton growing here. And they go right into the area where the phytoplankton stop and the zooplankton begin. And they bring that water with all these organically complex minerals and they 
filter sterilize it. They don't heat it. This is really important. This was like the cure-all in France. They used to do IVs and sub-Q injections of this in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They were curing these incurable diseases back then. You know, it was a bad time. They didn't have good medicine. They didn't have diets. People had all kinds of problems. And just getting them back to sea minerals was bringing them back to homeostasis and helping so many different problems. So they take this water, they filter sterilize it, and then you can have it either as straight seawater, which is called hypertonic, or seawater uh, diluted with spring water, and that's called isotonic. So tonicity is the saltiness of it, the salinity. Iso means same. Isotonic is same saltiness as you. It's 0.9% sodium chloride. And that is like C plasma. And in fact, when they were doing all the research on this at the turn of the century, uh, Rene Canton, who was doing all this, he was using it. They used it through two world wars as a blood plasma replacement. You lost a lot of blood in war. They put a big IV there, gave you liters of this to replace blood plasma. And because it had the same mineral, uh, the same mineral balance as your blood plasma did. And uh, so they were using it, they were nebulizing, injecting it, going uh, 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 subcutaneous and doing it orally. And now we use this as an oral supplement and you, the isotonic is healing to the gut. It's healing. It's been used by the, by the European naturalists, uh, naturopaths and the whole German biomedical uh, group that's all about extracellular matrix poise and uh, and lymphatic flow. And so they talk about the bioterrain being that area that bathes the cell and it should look like the ocean. So they take large doses of the isotonic to restore the bioterrain. And when you store the bioterrain, you restore lymphatic movement and you restore the environment around the cell. And if you're into Bruce Lipton's work on gene expression, where, is, where are the decisions made for gene expression? They're made by membranes. The membrane, the cell membrane is reading the terrain around it and saying, here's what I'm seeing and feeding back to the nucleus. But then uh, the newer work is seeing that the membranous organelles, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi body, and the mitochondria all speak together, and they take information from the cell membrane, add to it information they're getting from uh, the terrain inside the cell, and then communicating that to the nucleus to say, here is the environment, and this is the range of potentialities we have, and we can express genes according to that. This is a way you get so we talked about the brain being in survival mode, but the biochemistry gets into survival mode when the terrain is bad. And bringing it back to an oceanic terrain enables it to go back into the store of genes that say, hey, let's break out the genes that repair and rebuild everything now. So we want to set the neurological tone and we want to set the tone of the biological terrain and hydrogen and sea minerals are the best thing for setting the terrain, while the PC that's in all these nutraceuticals uh, and all these deliveries is setting the, setting the membrane tone to be able to bring all of these signals all the way through. And then some of these nutraceuticals are saying, hey, they're calling for gene sets. Let's call for neural repair. Let's call for detoxification. So you can see these ways that we're lining up all the potentiality in the system to emerge out of this broken, compressed uh, survival mode into a rebuilding mode. Mm -hmm. it's like if somebody, if a child was taking glutathione and the liver was being supported, is that then, do you feel like that's enough? Like if you're taking then the minerals and the things like that, because also too, I'm wondering like, you know, we want to make sure that parents are aware of, you know, again, too much. So this is a natural thing. Some our body needs it, but again, muscle testing, but what, how do you tell people to balance this out? Like how much is needed? Cause I know one of them helps to restore and then one helps keeps them, keep the maintenance more. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, 
you know, I'm trying to paint a picture where we're trying to hold homeostasis. And so what are our homeostasis things? So we've got the C minerals, bistonic C minerals, hydrogen, CBD are holding the middle. And then we're going to go in and slowly titrate up, use muscle testing uh, to find our inner doses and find our speed of titration up of these things that help detox, like glutathione, the DIM, uh, and then using bitters and binder to support that process. And then, you know, what cofactors might be necessary. When you're using sulfurs, molybdenum is, is usually a necessary counter to sulfurs so that you don't make too much uh, sulfite. Uh, mm -hmm. So with glutathione, think about molybdenum to go with it, but always think about these things that are setting, setting a, a balanced tone for us, hydrogen, isotonic, uh, and CBD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that's excellent. That's really, really, really helpful, I'm sure, for a lot of people. Um, do you have um, anything else that you think would be valuable to share before we wrap up? We just talked about a lot. I, so, yeah, we covered a lot. The, so, right, this is like a, a rock star interview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start this let's, January let's 1st. All right. we just, we're going to bring in the new year with this one, okay? We are. You know, we can watch this 20 times. So we'll just keep getting more. So yeah. we got homeostasis balancers. We said CBD, isotonic minerals, hydrogen. Then we talked about liver pathways in the beginning. So bitter compounds, PC to get that momentum through the liver, and then binders in the GI tract to hold that all together. Uh, then we talked about unlocking liver with DIM, and then adding into that glutathione. So those are huge things. And then we talked about mitochondria. So we had the one, bringing in PQQ, resveratrol, CoQ10, to upregulate uh, mitochondria and support regeneration of neurons and then on the hormone side we talked about adaptogens those also towards homeostasis bringing homeostasis uh, to the hormones so the adaptogens were in the one and the adaptogens were in the nano mojo and there we covered a lot of stuff you're working with those tools there's really nothing you can't do Right. And I will link to your website um, at the bottom of this podcast on this page at naturallyhealingautism.com. So um, would you like to um, share your uh, links and uh, if you have any, any studies or anything else that you want to share with us that, you know, we're definitely open to. So, yeah. so quicksilverscientific.com is our webpage. Uh, that one is geared towards uh, practitioners, and if you're looking to buy supplements, it will take you over to QS Life, which is our direct-to-consumer uh, pathway. Uh, but you can link to all the educational material from either one, or go right to YouTube and uh, search Quicksilver. You'll get our YouTube page. There's 26 one-and-a-half-hour webinars for those who like to dive and dive and dive and dive and dive and dive. And dive, and dive. <laughs> uh, this liver directionality is covered in our Black Box 2 webinar, which is on the Quicksilver Scientific homepage right now, plus it's in the YouTube. Perfect. All right, great. Thank you so, so much for being here today. This was really, really valuable information. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I greatly appreciate your knowledge, your expertise, and uh, especially for children on the autism spectrum because they're so, so, so specific and so delicate oh, yeah. in their needs, and, uh, and it's really important uh, to be able to support them properly and safely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it, and um, I think possibly we could have you again back in the future and maybe, you know... Yeah on uh, sp some specific topics or something. Yeah, six months we'll have, you know, uh, updates on it, new additions, uh, new ways to look at it, new ways to pair things. Right. There's always something new. Yeah, things are always growing, Race, new research, new developments. So yeah. we'll definitely make sure we stay on top of that and keep our parents as educated as we can so that they know uh, the best resources. Yeah, to and, and in fact, we have a bunch, uh, we have a study going on mold uh, with some of the mold specialists, and we have Andrew Usman 
uh, doing the same protocols on uh, some of our autism patients. Uh, so, you know, around the time of Autism One, we'll have some updates on, you know, how the best pairings went in there and, and how those protocols work. Great. And I actually have a Bruce Lipton interview that I will link to as well. And I have two different uh, interviews with two different uh, mold uh, biotoxin experts that oh, we'll also link to at the bottom of this page at naturalhealingautism.com. So, um, so yes, um, there's a lot of great information here for people. And we will, again, it never stops. That's why there's like always this ongoing education and new developments and changes and protocols because things get you know, we find new developments and things can get better over time. So we want to keep you abreast of what's going on and, um, and um, we'll have Dr. Shade come back again, hopefully with us in the future. And um, until then, take care, uh, slow and steady, please. And uh, I will definitely, Barbecue. <laughs> definitely link to that uh, muzzle testing video at the bottom of this page as well for you. Um, so you kind of get a gist of, of how you can have some control at home over you know knowing if a product or a food is okay to give to your child at that moment and uh, what the dosages are to start with and then how to muscle test daily or every couple of days to see what those dosages changes might be um, so that you uh, do it at the right pace and don't go too quickly for them. So um, until then, we'll see you next time and take care.